Where there's smoke, there's fire. Steam is picking up with the Pac-12 seemingly on the verge of imploding. What is the latest I'm hearing on that with regards to the Big 12, etc.? We're digging into that, and we're also talking fall camp with BYU defensive end Isaiah Banya. You are Locked On Cougars, your daily podcast on the BYU Cougars, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What's up, everybody? I'm Jay Catch, your host here on Locked On Cougars, your resident BYU insider. Thank you for making Locked On Cougars your first listen today. Thank you to all of you who are everydayers with us right here on the Locked On Podcast Network. By way of introductions, for some of you who may be checking us out for the first time, if you're coming back after a while, we are still your original daily podcast focused on all things BYU. And a big thank you for all of your support. Uh, by the way, a great response to the initial, I guess, supplementary, supplementary uh, episode of what I'm calling the Crossroads of the 12. Uh, it won't necessarily be an everyday thing, but I, if I've got an opportunity during the day to sit down and talk for 8, 10, 12 minutes about a certain topic, we'll do that. And uh, a lot of good response to the one we did talking about the Big 12 and the Pac-12 and that media rights deal that would have the Pac-12 apparently doing mainly streaming via Apple and having to subscribe to it. And that brings us to the starting point of today's podcast. Uh, Based on the conversations I have had all day today, so I'm recording this late Wednesday night. It's been a pretty wild day out there. A lot of rumors out there. Trust me. It's been all over the place. All three schools in the four corners outside of Colorado who has already joined the Big 12 are coming. As a lot of people are saying that Arizona, Arizona State, and Utah are being receptive to talks with the Big 12. Uh, is the Big 10 looking at expansion? According to reports from Dan Wetzel as well as Nicole Auerbach at the national level, there's at least some exploratory talks from the Big 10 about looking at adding Washington and Oregon to that conference along with Stanford and Cal potentially. Essentially, it sounds like these conferences are poised to pick the bones, quote unquote, of the Pac-12 clean. That would leave Washington State and Oregon State without a home. I would imagine the Mountain West Conference probably uh, makes a play to bring them into the fold with the Mountain West. But the, the crazy thing about this is, is I'm always reading this stuff, trying to track it, talking with people who I feel like are more in the know. And everything I'm hearing is that there is a snowball, I, and that's the analogy I used on Twitter last night. You can follow me at Jacob C. Hatch on Twitter. So the snowball is picking up, uh, picking up speed. I'm not saying that an announcement is coming tomorrow. Now, Arizona and Arizona State, there is a Board of Regents meeting scheduled for today. Uh, speaking of Thursday, I believe it was at, was at 5 o'clock or 6 o'clock Arizona time. Uh, and they are going to be in uh, what they call their executive session. There's no public discussion in this. But on the docket, it, it says that they are going to talk about athletics-related matters. Are they going to authorize the presidents of uh, both Arizona and Arizona State? Speaking of Robert C. Robbins for Arizona and Michael Crow from Arizona State, are they going to authorize Authorize them to look at joining the Big 12. We'll see. I'm interested to see what reports come out of this. But the conversation I had with at least one person who I trust far more on this stuff than anybody else, really, uh, they said that there is very... Uh, there's a very high level of uh, momentum leaning towards Arizona and Arizona State making the jump to the Big 12. Now, that is inevitably going to have a number of you saying, well, what about Utah, Jake? Utah, based on everything I understand, has been reticent from the get-go to leave the Big uh, not leave the Big 12, leave the Pac-12 because it's just a place that they've dominated. They feel comfortable in the Pac-12. But what I understand is that Utah is kind of seeing the chessboard moving around them, kind of reading the tea leaves and realizes, you know what, this is not a time to stand idly by. Does that mean that they are on the phone with Arizona, Arizona State right now saying, all right, when are we making this announcement? I, that I don't know. But there is momentum leaning towards right now those three schools uh, talking to the Big 12 at minimum. Now, there is a huge, huge domino that could play into this, and that is the ACC. Now, the Atlantic Coast Conference obviously is locked up with a media rights deal that is at their disadvantage until the middle part of the next decade, speaking of 2035, is when that media rights deal ends. Florida State yesterday, their president, uh, members of their regions, they're, they're, they were saying that it's not a matter of if, but when Florida State leaves. We need to have immediate action on unequal revenue sharing in the ACC to, to benefit us, speaking of Florida State. 
that saber rattling going on inside the ACC, you can guarantee that Clemson, Florida State, Miami, some of the heavy hitters in that conference, they're trying to find a way to wiggle off the hook that is the grant of rights and the, the media rights still that the ACC has with ESPN right now and trying to find themselves into the open market where they can be courted by the SEC, by the Big Ten, et cetera. If they succeed in blowing up the ACC, and what I mean by that is they jailbreak themselves from that deal in the Atlantic Coast Conference, that is a huge domino for the Big 12. Could the Big 12 then turn their attention more eastward where maybe they're looking at a Louisville or any one of the number of schools in the ACC to expand? That's the thing about this. Is there's a major domino there. But right now, all uh, eyes kind of are on Arizona right now. What are the Wildcats? What are the Sun Devils going to do? And that is the big question. Now, how does this pertain to BYU? Because this is not locked on Pac-12. This is not locked on Big 12. Those podcasts exist in their own sphere. But the way this involves BYU is you as a Cougar fan, I know that Utah just gets on everybody's nerves. I, I get that. But the way I understand it is BYU would not stand in the way of Utah joining the Big 12 Conference. They would uh, they would go out there and welcome them into the conference. And I think, for one, uh, it would actually be really fun to have these two back in the same conference one, once again. Makes it a conference game. Immediately, I'm telling you right now, immediately the Holy War, the BYU-Utah rivalry, is the top rivalry in the Big 12. I don't care what anybody says. It would become the best rivalry, the biggest rivalry in the conference, bar none. You can argue with me till your face, till, till, till you're blue in the face, and I'll tell you you're wrong. That would be a phenomenal thing to have, and I know that BYU would welcome it. Now, well, I don't know that, but I, I the way I understand is that BYU would welcome Utah coming into the conference. Now, the big question is, does the Big 12 want that? Because there is some thought out there that Brett Yormark in the Big 12 office is not as keen on Utah as somebody like BYU is. That is that is the big question in all of this. Is is Utah's hubris that they have been kind of spewing uh, since this whole thing started going down over a year ago? Is that going to come at their uh, to their uh, discredit? I don't know how to say it perfectly. Is it going to hurt them in all of this? That's the big question that I don't have an answer for, and we're all going to have to kind of wait and see how this plays out. I didn't expect this much momentum to be moving as quickly as it is, but it's kind of the way things go in conference realignment. When things start to shift, they start to really just kind of piece by piece. Colorado kind of kicked this off, and it feels like Arizona Arizona State could be the next move. Then does the, the, the board start moving a lot more where the Big Ten decides, to okay, now it's blown up. We're going to go get Oregon and Washington. There's so many questions still to be answered with regards to all of this. But the other thing about BYU is you should welcome more Western-based teams to join this conference. Speaking of Arizona, Arizona State, be, they'd be back together like they were in the early days of the WAC. It would absolutely be awesome, I think, for BYU to have Colorado, who's already joining the Big 12, along with ASU and Arizona, to make a very strong Western flank of the Big 12 conference. Now, obviously, balances the schedule where the travel may not necessarily be as stringent for BYU. You're not having to go cross-country seemingly annually to either UCF, Cincinnati, Cincinnati, West Virginia, etc. It would give you some shorter trips to Arizona, which are much more manageable, and a trip to Colorado is far more manageable than having to make trips to the East Coast on a constant basis. So I think you welcome this as a Cougar fan. Now, like I said, your, your personal feelings on Utah are, I'm sure, all over the place. There are some of you that say, I, I like Utah in the conference. There's some of you who say, Hell no, I don't want Utah in the conference. Apologies for the for the curse word there. But that's the, that, that's the thing about this is, there's going to be some interesting, I think, uh, in some cases, holding your nose and kind of hoping for the best in certain ways. I, I think Utah would be doing that. They, I think they're just very reticent, honestly, to join the Big 12 Conference. It's kind of the feel I get about the Utes. Uh, it could be the fact that they don't want to be on, quote-unquote, the same level as BYU. I, I don't know what it is, but there is just something there that I, I'm just kind of reading the tea leaves. That Utah, they're very, very uh, just... We don't really want to do this, but if Arizona and Arizona State are going to do it, we kind of got to do it too. That's the way I kind of read how Utah's looking at this situation. So we'll see what happens. But speaking just from the BYU perspective, you should absolutely embrace having Arizona and Arizona State in the conference. I think it would be awesome to have them there. Obviously, Arizona brings another power brand in basketball in and of itself to this conference. And like I said, it just opens up a, a, a new opportunity on the western flank or the western edges of the conference to allow BYU to have some easier road trips and obviously uh, bring together some more, 
I guess, regional uh, type opponents and rivals for them to play as well. So very interesting stuff uh, still to come, but stay tuned. It feels like day by day. Like I said, anything I talk about right now, whenever you listen to this, could be completely outdated. That's the thing about this. It's just it's moving so quickly, and uh, I'll kind of uh, I'm going to track things throughout the rest of the day today on Thursday, and I'll probably do another short uh, with Crossroads of the Twelve edition to kind of update on how things are looking at that point. But uh, stay tuned. It'll be very, very interesting to see where everything ultimately shakes out. But it is moving quick. Honestly, it is moving very, very fast, much faster than I anticipated it being. I thought after Colorado jumped, I thought there'd be a little bit of a lull in the action. Nope, doesn't sound that way. Sounds like it's only picking up speed, as I mentioned on social media. All right, coming up here in just a minute, let's actually talk some BYU football. Had a great chance earlier this week to catch up with Isaiah Banya, obviously incoming defensive end from Boise State. Got Guy who was a fantastic interview. We talked with him in the spring. Had a chance to catch up with him on day one of BYU training camp. We'll get his thoughts on how things are going early on in camp. And also some updates from day two of BYU camp from our practice insiders. We'll get to all that as we continue on right here on Locked On Cougars. Now, a word on our friends over at LinkedIn. Every day, these new uh, new potential hires out there, if you're a hiring manager or a small business owner, can feel like a high-stakes wager for your business. You want to be 100% certain that you have access to the best qualified candidates that are available to you, and that's why I would encourage you guys to give our friends at LinkedIn Jobs your business. LinkedIn Jobs helps you find the right people for your team faster, and the best part is for free. Uh, go set up your profile now with the job posting you've got. The best part about this is you can add your job in the purple hashtag hiring frame to your LinkedIn profile to help spread the word that you're hiring right away. Simple tools like screening questions will make it easy to focus on the candidates with just the right skills and experience so you can quickly prioritize who you'd like to interview and hire and make the move there. It's why small businesses are rating LinkedIn Jobs number one in delivering quality hires versus leading competitors. Check it out, my friends. LinkedIn Jobs wants to help you find the qualified candidates that you want to talk to faster. Post your job for free right now at LinkedIn.com slash LockedOnCollege. That's LinkedIn.com slash LockedOnCollege to get started today. Terms and conditions apply. Thank you once again for making Locked On Cougars your first listen of the day. Thank you to all of you who are everydayers with us here on the podcast. Coming up on tomorrow's show, uh, we'll be getting you ready for our next media availability. It's also a mailbag Friday. The last two weeks, we have not done a mailbag, and I actually kind of miss it. So if you've got questions, and a number of you have already sent questions earlier this week, we'll get to those. But if you've got questions now, please submit them via social media or email. I'd love to hear from you guys and answer what you guys want to talk about on a Friday. We're also, like I said, going to talk about the latest with regards to Big 12 expansion potentially and we'll also announce our winners of our giveaway. We've been doing this for over a month, collecting uh, entries uh, in terms of people subscribing to the channel. We'll be announcing who won that Jaron Hall football. We'll also give away a bunch of other BYU swag. So uh, stay tuned for all that and appreciate all of your guys' support when it comes to the podcast. All right. Time now to let you guys hear from Isaiah Banyo. I had a great chat with this young man, a guy that I really have enjoyed getting to know. I had a great chat with him, many of you might recall, back in spring camp. I didn't necessarily know much about him. had a great chance to catch up with him at the start of BYU training camp. He is a guy who's going to be expected to take on a bigger role this year for BYU and obviously help bolster their uh, pass rush and hopefully their sack numbers. Uh, when you were 129th out of 130 teams, in total sacks a year ago as a team, uh, there's only one way to go up. And a guy like Isaiah Banya hopefully will help boost that number for BYU. And a great chat with him about that. Some of the younger players in the position group that he likes as well. So all that right now with Isaiah Banya on Locked on Cougars. Day one, how's it feel to actually know that hey, the season is on its way officially? Man, it's exciting. It's a great energy outside, man. You know, it's a great, it's a great vibe to come outside and be with the guys again, put the helmet on. So I'm excited. We're looking forward to the rest of fall camp, man. It's a good way to start off. Now, I talked to you in the spring. You talked a lot about like what you wanted to improve on during the offseason. Do you feel like you accomplished what you wanted to accomplish? I do. You know, I totally do. And I feel like we all have as a defense in general. You know, you see us coming in all, all summer camp and all our workouts and training. Mm -hmm. You know, we all just took a, a next step up. So, you know, we're looking good and we're doing we're ready, man. We're ready. What's been the messaging from the coaching staff getting ready for the Big 12 so far? You know, like, really what we've just been working on, like, we had to take, we all know that we have to take that next level, that next step to the next level, right? And so with that being said, everybody take it, took it that much more serious. Everybody worked that much more harder. And everybody pushed it one more percent further than what they would originally. So that's really what it came down to at the end of the day. And shoot, we'll see, uh, you know, what, what comes from it this uh, fall camp. Saw you mainly in a two-point stance today, playing up on that D-line. Is it, is it going to kind of rain, depend on the game to game if you're in a three-point over two-point, or does it matter? Really? Yeah, man, right now I'm just feeling everything else. So today yeah. I just wanted to, because I'm originally in a two-point stance. Yes. 
you know, maybe later on I'll get into a three-point stance here and there, but right now I just wanted to come out, get a feel for it one more time, get back into the rhythm of things, and, you know, we'll see if things switch up later on. What, what is the difference between pass rushing out of a two-point stance versus a three-point? Is there, is there that big of a difference? Honestly, it just really depends on the type of athlete you are, okay. in my opinion, and uh, the play style you have as a D lineman. For me personally, because I am more of a twitchier DN, mm -hmm. and I like to get off in my speed, my get off, that's why I like to use a two-point stance, because I can have a little more of a motor and also more of a better jet get off out of my two-point stance. Whereas in some dudes like Batty, I feel like he personally gets, like in his pass rush, the best out of the three-point stance because he's more of a heavier body, but coming out of that angle works better for him. As in for me, it's really just the same for me in a two-point stance or a three-point stance. So it really just depends at the end of the day. Yeah, player to player, I guess. It's yeah, 100%. Team. Now, with regards to getting ready for this season, is the defense, what are the differences between your time at Boise State versus playing in this defense so far? Right, so Bulls defense has had like amazing dudes on the team, you know, a bunch of playmakers, guys who can, you know, really get to the ball, which is something that I'm used to. And it's really good to come over here and see the exact same kind of talent and that level of, you know, comp competition. I feel like, you know, the difference is basically just comes from, you know, the, the defense that's implemented yeah. and the technique of fundamentals that are being coached on a daily basis. Obviously it's different in those, in those terms, but there's actually quite a bunch of similarities when you look at the bull defenses that I've been on. Okay, who's going to be the better Boise State transfer, you or Jackson? <laughs> you know, I have the best hopes for Jackson. I hope he goes out there and does what he does, man. So, you know, it, of course we're going to go out there and compete, man. Yeah. But, shoot, time will tell. We're going to see. Okay, well, I like, I like that answer. Very diplomatic. Yeah, I, I, time I, will tell. Well done, well done. But with regards to now, you're playing the Power 5 level, obviously. Is yes, that, sir. How excited are you for that aspect of this? Man, I can't wait. It's literally what I came here for. Okay. You know, at the end of the day, like, it's, it's I wanted to play on – at a big level and I want to play with guys who you know can only make me better as well you know so with that being said yeah I'm a, we're all excited you know I feel like we're all getting ready and we all are almost there you know so with that being said that's what we're taking this mindset into fall camp with you know like I said up the level of competition in every phase is there a defensive end in this unit that's a young buck that you like you you'd be like hey keep an eye on that kid ice ma okay ice yeah for sure you know why because he you know, he actually reminds me a lot of myself. Okay. Especially for being a young guy who has so much potential and like he has that automatic like talent, just natural talent, you know. So it's it's cool to see that and he's he's also my boy, you know, so it's cool to see that and that's definitely somebody you need to look keep an eye out for in the future. Well, no, he's and he's a, he's a BYU player that a lot of people have been kind of tracking during his time in high school. I had a chance yeah. to cover him in high school with my some oh. of my radio coverage. What it, what do you think is his best skill right now? Right now? Uh huh. Pass rush. Okay. Just as a pure pass rush specialist coming 100%. Off the edge. You know, because like, that's why I said, you yeah. know, he's similar to me because when I first came in, my best, uh, my best uh, aspect was my get off and my pass rush. Yeah. And that's what I see in him. You know, obviously, you know, he, he, he works hard in all phases of the defense, but his special talent my, right now, in my opinion, mm -hmm. is his pass rush. That's Last thing for me is obviously this is a, this is a month long. This is a little bit of a grind, oh, yeah, yeah. and yeah. two weeks in, it feels like okay, it was season. No, you're halfway through. What's going to keep this team engaged through this entire month leading up to the season? Man, it's all our purpose. Mm -hmm. Then the purpose we have as a team, and you know we sit here in our team meetings and talk about what we want out of this season, what we want from each other, from a, from a staff's point of view, you know, and it's it's really cool to see how much of a bond and relation we all share in regards to our purpose for the season, you know, because we are going coming into a new conference. This is a new beginning and something really historical, a historical moment for this university and the city. Yeah. And that's something that we want to take seriously. So, you know, with, with that being said, that's really what it comes down to, man. Our purpose as a team. All right, well, school. Isaiah, thank you so much for the time. Yes, sir, thank you very much. There you go, Isaiah Banya, BYU defensive end, and a big thank you to him for taking the time. And apparently he's very high on Ice Moa. And I, it's a guy I think a number of you out there in Cougar Nation absolutely are hoping uh, can have a breakout season. What I have seen from Isaiah is he is very uh, well put together as an athlete. He's, he's really kind of honed his body in terms of just how he looks. He looks the part of a defensive end, and hopefully he can become an impact guy for the Cougars. The nice part is you got guys like Tyler Batty out there, the aforementioned Isaiah Banya. The pass rush for BYU should be improved this 
season simply due to the fact that they are going to a new four-man front, which should allow more pass rush opportunities for guys like Isaiah Banyan. Turn talk about the fact that he likes to be in a two-point stance, whereas a guy like Tyler Batty is better in a three-point. It all depends on the athlete. So uh, I'm hopeful that BYU will see an increase in their sack output and obviously just overall uh, harassment of opposing quarterbacks because Jay Hill has promised that. He says, we're not going to sit back. We will bring pressure. And if he has to bring blitzes to generate that pressure, he will do that. But he would love nothing more than to have guys like Batty, Ice Mo, and Isaiah Banya, et cetera, really force the action and, and really uh, bring the pressure off the edge. If they can get home with four guys, it's a win for BYU's defense and, and hopes for an improved product defensively this year. All right, a couple of notes from one of our practice insiders yesterday who was out at practice day two. This is the stuff, by the way, that you will not find anywhere else other than this podcast. It's kind of unique to this show. It's something I, I'm very proud uh, to have. We've got people that talk to me and trust me with their information. But a couple of things from day uh, two. Uh, Ryder Burton continues to really throw it well. The thing about all these quarterbacks, Nick Billups on the roster, obviously Jake Retzloff, as well as Keaton Slovis, they're all slinging the rock very, very well. And that's the thing about this. Ryder Burton, a lot of people out there wondered what BYU saw in him. I think we're starting to really see it. We saw it during the spring camp uh, period, also the spring game when he started slinging the rock around. He's looked very good, and that's the second time it's been pointed out to me from the first couple of days of BYU practice. He's throwing it really well. Uh, once again, Darius Lasser and Keelan Marion continue to impress uh, people at practice. Those are the two incoming transfers. Obviously, Darius Lasseter from Eastern Michigan, Keelan Marion via UConn, and having those guys stand out early on in camp is a positive for BYU's wide receivers because that does not mean that Keanu Hill, Cody Epps, and Chase Roberts are looking bad by any means because they are looking phenomenal in their own right. They look the part. So having those five in particular at wide receiver would be a big, big deal for a guy like uh, Keaton Slovis to have a number of targets to throw the rock to. Other things, uh, running back, uh, at the running back position, Deion Smith is starting to really kind of show what he's capable of. We all know that Aiden Robbins is expected to be the lead guy for BYU, but you can't rely on just one guy all year long. The Tyler Algiers of the world, yeah, they're one of a kind for a reason. There's a reason and why they're as good as they are. I think the BYU would love to have Aiden Robbins be the dude at running back, but having guys like Deion Smith flanking him and obviously spelling him at times is good to hear that. And the other thing about this, the other thing that was pointed out as well, is that uh, BYU continues to just kind of use that, and they use a split squad uh, system here. And uh, a couple of you mentioned this, I think it was Outside View. I may have mentioned this on, uh, on YouTube in a comment. Well, that means that BYU is in a worse place than they are. Not at all. The idea of what they're doing, splitting the team and having them do two uh, team periods is to get guys extra reps. It's experience, folks. The thing about practice is there are only so many guys that can play at an individual time. There's 120 dudes on the roster for BYU. They actually upped it. It used to be 110 guys could join fall camp. Now you can have 120 guys. BYU essentially, and the way it was explained to me by a person inside the program on uh, Tuesday, so that would be day one of practices, is they essentially went down the roster and, and halved it. They, they said, okay, you 60 guys are going over there, you 60 guys are going over here, and we're going to run drills against one another. It's not anything that that's negative. It's an idea just to get extra guys, extra reps, and get them an opportunity to go out there and play football. The only way you really improve, and you guys know this, any of you who have played sports at any level, no matter what the sport is, I, I, I golf mostly these days. That's kind of my sport of choice right now. But with regards to golf, if I don't get it, I actually swing the sticks on the course, how am I actually going to improve? I can go to the driving range all I want and hit shot after shot, and that's an important part of it. But actually getting out on the course and having the, the experience factor, that's what BYU uses in the split scrimmage uh, system here. It's to get guys extra reps, get them engaged in the program, gauge where they're at as athletes. And I don't expect them to continue to ha split the squad all training camp long. I imagine this probably lasts one or two weeks, and then they will really kind of establish, okay, here's the depth chart. And then at that point, you really start sinking in the most reps into your first and second string players. The other guys go to the scout team, and they have to do their work in terms of giving that first and second unit a better look as scout team members. This is in no way a negative. It's 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 a positive, and I'm, frankly, I'm, I'm actually stunned that BYU and other programs have not used it more often, because like I said, it gives you extra opportunities to have young players show what they're capable of. They may have otherwise been buried on the depth chart, not been able to give that opportunity to show what they're capable of. I, I don't see it in any other way than a positive. So uh, if you guys see it as a negative, so be it. But I, I'm going to tell you you're wrong because I just think it's absolutely uh, something that BYU can utilize. So just got a couple updates from day two. Uh, I'm very much looking forward to being 
get back out there on Friday. That'll be the next time we have media availability, and obviously we'll have a full report for you guys uh, coming from that. All right, a final couple of notes from today's show includes a look back at two games from the 2021 season. We'll call it the Baylor-Romney run for BYU over those two games, both at US against USF as well as a road game at Utah State. We'll talk about both of those coming up here in just a moment right here on Locked on Cougars. Thank you once again for making Locked On Cougars your uh, just part of your routine. Thank you for your support. It truly means the world to me. The number of you uh, check this out on a daily basis, not a number of you, thousands of you, if you if you believe the download and view numbers. And I just I'm really appreciative of your guys' support of this venture. It really makes my job easy when you guys are supporting the product. And obviously, I enjoy it, obviously, enough to come back day after day to get updates on BYU. All right, a couple of notes before we go on today's show is congratulations are in order. It's, it's watch list season we saw ryan rico be named to the ray guy award watch list so congrats to him it's the best punter in the country kingsley sulmati has been named to the outland trophy award watch list so congratulations to all these players on getting that opportunity uh does it mean that they're going to win the award no but it means that at least they're on the radar of these committees that make that award decision and obviously that, that there's no downside to any of that final notes before we go on today's show though i include a look back at two games from byu in the 2021 season we talked yesterday about the asu game now there's one thing I felt the note in the ASU game uh, last night before I got on my soapbox to talk about the Rock situation that apparently has had some resolution to it, and hopefully they'll be able to figure it all out with all that going on. But in that game against Arizona State, many of you might recall, Jaron Hall took a pretty hard hit. He had, and uh, after the game, he got up in front of the media, oh, I'm good. And, and uh, trust me, he was not good. He broke ribs, folks, in that game against Arizona State. He, he was saying, I'm going to be good. I'm going to play next week. No, he wasn't. He was not going to play because he had broken ribs, and BYU is going to be very careful with him. So that thrust Baylor Romney into action as they took on USF the following week. BYU had risen to number 15 in the country after those back-to-back -back wins over Utah and ASU. Feeling good about BYU's chances in 2021, and Baylor Romney comes in and did nothing uh, bad in, in this game against USF. USF was pretty plucky in this game. I'll give them that. BYU ends up winning this one. 35 to 27. They race out to a 28 to 6 lead at halftime, and USF came roaring back in the second half, scoring 21 points to just seven points for BYU. Uh, BYU was able to hold on in this one. Baylor Romney, 20 of 25, 305 yards and three touchdowns. Very efficient performance. Tyler Algier, 15 carries, 86 yards and two touchdowns. Like it was just a very efficient performance for BYU. Pushed them to 4 and 0 on the season, and then the following week, BYU made the trip to Utah State to take on the Aggies and. Baylor Romney started once again because uh, uh, it was continued when you were broken ribs. It's just it, you have to take some time off, and that's exactly what you had to uh, just kind of wait and see with regards to Jaron Hall's status. But Romney came into this game, ended up 15 of 19 for 187 yards and one touchdown in this game. But the game that the player that really mattered in this game, but the other thing about this is many of you might recall Baylor Romney then, uh, was it the third quarter of that game? Uh, slams his head on the turf and is out due to a concussion. So Jacob Conover had to come into the game and saw probably his most extensive action of his entire BYU career, finishing 5 of 9 for 45 yards in that game. Uh, did enough. But BYU was led by the man Tyler Algier. This is one of the seminal performances of Tyler Algier's run at BYU because he ended up 22 carries, 218 yards. He averaged 9.9 .9 yards per carry. Folks, he nearly averaged a first down every time he touched the ball in this game. Ended up with three touchdowns in this game as BYU beat Utah State up there at Romney or what is it, Maverick Stadium now, 34-20. to 20. Uh, They were ranked number 13 in the country at that time. You remember the hype was really getting going for BYU at this point. But the question was, okay, you now have both of your top two quarterbacks, speaking of Jaron Hall and Baylor Romney injured, who's going to be able to play next week? And that's something we'll talk about on tomorrow's show, but I, I don't want to overlook what Tyler Algier did in this 2021 season. It was absolutely masterful, and this is one of those performances against Utah State that should not be forgotten. I know it was a road game, so it doesn't necessarily stand out like the big play he had against ASU in that win at LES, but for him to go out there and average what he did, like I said, 22 carries, 218 yards, he put BYU on his back almost single handedly in this game and help lift them to the win. BYU was in a dogfight early on in this one and I think it was yeah, it was 24 to 13 at halftime. But Tyler Algier said, "You know what? Enough of this." 
I'm leading BYU to the win. BYU as a team ended up running for 221 yards. And the other thing about this is BYU's defense absolutely shut down Utah State's rushing attack. 35 carries for the Aggies, just 31 yards. That's a 0.9 yard per carry average. Tyler Algier, just absolutely masterful performance. And BYU's defense stepped up in a big way in this game and got the win for BYU, pushing them to 5-0. and But then, uh, obviously, the quarterback situation being what it was, there were huge question marks about what the next week was going to look like for BYU. And we'll talk about that tomorrow because it was the first blemish on the record in 2021. And what like I said, we'll get to that on tomorrow's edition of the podcast. All right, that's going to do it for today. A big thank you to all of you for your support of the podcast. As I said, uh, we're going to, on our Friday edition of the podcast, we're going to get uh, to some questions. Obviously, we'd love nothing more than for you guys to weigh in with those. If you have questions, please send them in now. And a big thank you all the same for your support of the podcast. Thank you for making it your first listen of the day. Thank you to all of you who are everydayers with us here on the podcast. Truly means the world to me that you guys support it as much as you do. And hope you guys have a great rest of your Thursday whenever you hear this. I had to make sure what day it was in my mind. But nonetheless, thank you for all your support. We'll be back with you guys again soon. This has been the Locked on Cougars podcast. See ya.